Hi, everyone. We are so thrilled to be with you here today at ProductCon. Um, I'm Nicole Breskin. Uh, I oversee news and entertainment vertical products here at Disney. Um, brands including ABC News, Marvel, Nat Geo, and ABC Entertainment. And data is just such a massive part of everything that we do here to drive our decision making. Um, and I couldn't be thrilled, um, more thrilled to be here with this panel today to moderate this discussion on using data to make effective decisions in product management. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to our panelists to introduce themselves. And um, Abby, I'll kick it over to you. Awesome. Great to be here. Uh, I'm Abby. I'm a director of product at Amplitude. Um, I focus on essentially helping product teams answer questions with their product data and collaborate around it. So definitely excited about this panel, given what we do is help teams make better decisions with data and also managing a team of PMs who are trying to do the same thing definitely gets meta, but makes me very excited uh, for the topic today. Um, and Ryan. Over to you. Yeah, excited to be here. As well, I'm the founder and CEO of Sprig, and we're a product insights platform that uh, complements both analytics, uh, so tools such as Amplitude, as well as A-B testing, uh, tools such as Chameleon, uh, quite well. And what we do is we do in-product surveys, as well as session replay and concept testing to help product teams and product managers understand the why. And backed by Andreessen Horowitz, Excel, and first round capital and work with many of the fastest growing tech companies, including uh, Loom, Square, Robinhood, Coinbase, Dropbox, and Notion. Amazing. And Colin, great to see you as always. Um, tell us about you. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, great to be here. I'm Colin. I'm leading Chameleon here in North America. Uh, Chameleon's known for a couple things, uh, one of which is uh, we're known for all team experimentation. That's where you have multiple teams coming together on a single platform to do experimentation on the web, but you could also do experimentation in the back end with your products. Um, we're also known for our AI, which gives a score to every single visitor that comes to your site based off their propensity to convert on any single KPI. So. Uh, we are huge lovers of the, the product world and all of the data that powers it. So happy to be with you all today. Great. Well, we're going to just jump right in. Um, again, so excited to be here today. Um, so just getting us started, um, team, I'd love to hear from you. What are some of the co common ch challenges that product managers face when using data analytics to inform uh, their decision making processes? I'm happy to, to kick off, and my background's always been in product management uh, right out of college. And so uh, the reason why I started Sprig was I was previously the first product manager at Weebly, and we were quickly growing uh, to run 100 million ARR and 400 people, and we were getting all of our data in place. And so we actually were probably relatively late for most companies today for getting that analytics instrumentation in place and that A-B testing in place and getting those really crisp revenue dashboards in place as well. And we started to get everything instrumented and you know, started to realize that we didn't really understand the why behind the revenue trends that we were seeing or perhaps the analytics trends that we were seeing or maybe even some of the A-B testing trends that we were seeing. And so you know, that's the reason why I uh, moved on from product management to starting a company in the product insights category is to help companies really understand the why. And so I think a, a big challenge a lot of companies are facing today is that they might have partial data sets. Maybe they have the uh, analytics data and the revenue data. Maybe they have the A-B testing analytics data. But we do see a lot of companies missing the experience insights and really understanding and putting the customer first into understanding their sentiment around whether a feature or product is meeting customer needs. And so I just really encourage a lot of teams and product managers out there to look at the different types of data and see, do you have really that complete holistic picture into not only maybe how much revenue you're making off of a given uh, customer or account, but do you really understand their behavior? Do you understand the why behind their decisions and look at all those data sets together to be data driven? I see a lot of product teams today being data driven around very specific types of data that can be misleading. And so taking that complete picture uh, is really one of the challenges I see today in an area that like, we've been excited to work with teams with. 
Yeah, um, definitely agree with all that. And I think kind of going off of that idea of the complete picture, another challenge that I see people facing is either kind of stopping work when the metric doesn't look good and maybe incorrectly like abandoning the initiative too early because you chose the wrong metric or maybe the wrong maturity of metric, or on the other hand, cherry picking the data that really tells the story that you want it to tell um, and actually continuing with an initiative when it, it no longer makes sense. Um, something interesting that I think kind of going back to that complete picture is, especially early on in a product stage, I think a mistake people can make is to set metrics that are just at the wrong maturity level. So for example, like, you know, a usage metric when you're trying to actually take a big swing with a new persona or maybe investigating into you know something like AI, maybe metrics aren't going to be the way that you can kind of successfully measure that, in which case looking at some of the other signals that Ryan mentioned, I think sometimes people forget to do and, and kind of either abandon initiatives or continue with something um, that they shouldn't. I think the, the, the that's all well and true and you know, I just think we also have to like be really mindful that one of the biggest challenges that PMs or marketers face, anybody that's operating in today, is just the the volume of data that we're getting, the and, and the velocity it comes to us. Uh, it's just overwhelming. So I think one of the biggest challenges you have to uh, be ready to face is to to know your enemy. Um, what kinds of data should you be looking at uh, precisely? And then being really uh, forward thinking and, and, and explore like, okay, well, this data is important to me and my team, but how does it affect other parts of the business? Um, that's what really separates, I think, the goods from the greats is that they're not only aware of like the data that's important to them, but they're also gonna be very informed about how their performance affects another part of the machine. Absolutely. And I think um, it's so key, not only when you set your metrics, like what are the metrics, like your guardrail metrics that you don't want to mess with? And then also what are the metrics that maybe, you know, are not really success factors um, in the, te you know, in, in what you're looking at. So which, which dovetails really nicely into just like, team, like how, how should PMs be thinking about setting success metrics for, you know, the products they're looking after? Um, and secondly, just an area that I know, um, Abby, you're, you're really excited about is like, how, how, how should PMs be integrating data into their product lifecycle? What are some best practices? Yeah, yeah, happy to kick off on that one. Um, I think one thing that we always recommend at Amplitude and that I, I use on my team too is before you start a project or before you work on, on a product, really asking yourself, what are the key questions that I want to learn or answer with this initiative? So rather than starting with, hey, let me go ahead and, you know, to your point, call and tag every single thing and care about all the pieces of data, what are actually the questions that the team wants to answer with an initiative? And then go to, okay, what data do I, I already maybe have that I could use for that? Or what data maybe am I going to miss and not track? Um, if I if I don't instrument this now. So I think that's one key thing that I would do is just make sure you're kind of taking a question first approach to data um, and really going about it in that way. And the other thing that I'd, I'd say here in terms of integrating it into the team is also make analytics more of a team sport. So I think like analytics is best when you're kind of working and ripping with someone. So something that we tend to do um, at Amplitude is we actually integrated, you know, bringing in the team at all stages of the development cycle around data, which actually makes it a really fun exercise as well. So when you're kicking something off, like actually getting the team, the engineers, designers, PM together and actually have them brainstorm around what that set of questions is that you wanna answer. Typically you'll find that they have other questions you haven't thought about and maybe even changes the product that you ended up building. Um, so definitely doing that, bringing data into the design process, actually asking your designer, like what questions could I answer for you that would make the experience better if you knew, um, which I think can also bring more data-driven development. And then finally, when it comes to the results cycle, like one of my favorite meetings that we hold at Amplitude is actually pulling the results and then bringing the team together and actually live looking at all of the results and dashboards. 
um, and asking them what other questions they have. And if you have a tool like Amplitude, you can even on the spot live answer those questions together, which just gets everybody thinking. And typically we found a lot of our new hypotheses come out of those sessions. Um, so I would just say, make sure you take a question first approach and also trying to make it a more collaborative experience around data in general. Yeah. One area that, you know, I think one of the biggest tips that I would say for any, any product manager out there is making sure you're segmenting the right user base. And so your company strategy for the year, your OKRs, your quarterly goals, whatever your North Star is, there's always going to be a specific user persona that you're focused on as a product manager. And a lot of companies will look at their data uh, as if every user is the same, yeah, every user is a focus for the company. And I've seen A-B tests where you actually have the test version uh, outperform control, but it's perhaps not with the user segment that your company is focused on. I've seen analytics data where trends maybe trend in the right direction, but it's not the specific user segment that your company is focused on. And experience data as well. You know, we've seen in product surveys for our customers, uh, you know, move metrics, but also not you know the right uh, user segment. And one of our customers, Coinbase, uh, they just published a case study with us, and what they wanted to do was improve their tax center. And crypto taxes is, you can imagine, very scary, very complex. And they wanted to focus on how they can empower more of their advanced users to improve and arm them with. Uh, the tax information that they needed to actually successfully file their taxes with crypto. And they're able to segment specifically to the power traders and people that had made trades on other platforms. And when they looked and segmented all their data to that specific group, it gave them really key insights into exactly what they needed to do. Now, if they looked at the broader user base, the majority is actually the less advanced users. It would have actually driven their roadmap in a different direction. And so when we look at segmentation, making sure that across all your data sets, you're segmenting specific personas that are strategically important for the business is going to give you the best signal on what to do next with your product. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I think it always comes back down to like what you said earlier, Ryan, which is that, you know, you're trying to answer the why and, you know, if you can't easily, sometimes I just recommend to any PM or marketer out there, like just stop with the data for a second, just stop and see if you can tell your friend a story about how your customer or your user perform. And if you can't easily articulate the, a story about uh, why they're behaving a certain way or why that A-B test resulted in a certain uh, you know performance outcome, then you may not have like a complete uh, understanding of what you're trying to solve for. And so, yeah, just sometimes uh, avoiding uh, the data overload can be helpful and, and getting back to the story. Like one of the features that we've got on our site, which it's one of those like buried features that, you know, it's easy to overlook. But to me, it's really cool because it's a spider chart and, you know, an experimentation. It's very easy to like juice one metric. Like you could say like, OK, well, I just am going to shove a ton of traffic over to this particular feature and or I'm going to offer like 50 percent off. And that's why I'm going to see a huge increase in like add to cart. But, you know, you want to have a holistic picture of like how it's affecting your overall business. And uh, that spider chart is super helpful to that 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 bigger picture like you can see that okay i've added to cart but i've totally decreased transactions or you know i've answered that tax question but i've completely like spun up a, a long call list uh, to my uh, call center or something like this so i just feel like yeah you want to make sure you're uh, understanding the story at all times because that's what helps you kind of stay oriented about what you're trying to solve for one thing i just um kind of add on to that or something that we do to kind of, it, it is leveraging data, but to get to the why is when we do release a new feature, like basically using data to actually take a look at who used the feature, who didn't, you know, what other trends are you seeing, and then actually target those users with a research study or a survey to actually follow up and understand what's going on. So actually, rather than just setting metrics, just looking at who used, who dropped off, and then retargeting essentially those users um, with a study to understand more of like, okay, we are seeing things go up, but we can't explain it. Why might that be? And you can leverage data to do better user research targeting to get at that why. I love it. 
And I think the, not only is the why so important, defining the why, but telling the why and telling it broadly. Those of us product managers know, like your 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 success. There's no I in product, and you know your success only depends on how well you can get everyone else on the team on board. Um, uh, so you know, for me at least, we work we work with sales folks, we work with marketers at Disney. We work with a ton of creatives. Um, so you know, for my next question for this group, um, how do you make sure teams are working in lock, lockstep, and how are you? How do you tell the story? Tell the why. Um, to, to, you know, broad-based things? I want to take a stab at that one because uh, this is a question that just fascinates me. And it's I think it speaks to, like, two cool things that are happening in the, like, product uh, today. One is that um, the world has changed. It used to be that you could... Uh, have your marketers over here optimizing like their acquisition funnels, get, doing really amazing marketing and uh, creating tons of leads that would then be handed off to the product team. And, and then product would take them and go optimize for retention and adoption. And nary the two sides would ever meet. And that old fashioned way is like, uh, thankfully being obliterated. Companies that are really doing well today they either have a single unified growth team or they at least have their product and their marketing teams collaborating. And that way they're able to like, to your point, Nicole, really understand how to stay in lockstep together. Um, if you don't do that collaboration, then you really are setting yourself up to not be like one of the leading companies. Um, that There's so much great research about this today. And, I, and if anyone's interested, ping me and I'll, I'll share it with you. But I think that's just so important. Is, if you can't create a feedback loop between product and marketing, if you're not powering those two levers of marketing-led growth and product-led growth, then you're really missing out on an opportunity to like be a, be a stellar business. So I would say look at how to, you could create that feedback loop, and then you're going to be off to a much more uh, better position. Yeah, I, um, I worked at Dropbox prior to Amplitude, and we um, had various configurations of our growth and marketing teams over the time that I was there. But I think one kind of tradition that really helped with that, that was tactical, was we did have a separate marketing growth and even product team, but we had regular weekly self-service business reviews where we looked at that end-to-end -end funnel of, you know, what are the marketing metrics of the traffic coming in? How are we seeing that convert to signups? And then even looking at trial conversion quality and even refunds from that business. So just really looking at the end to end. So each team felt responsible for the entire end to end funnel, even though they were directly accountable maybe to one or two of the metrics within that. So it's just kind of a ritual that gets everybody thinking like, hey, we're, we're all contributing to the same thing. So setting something like that up, even if you're not a single team can be kind of a simple first ritual to, to get going in that direction. It's amazing that we even say that out loud and it's like something so, that sounds so brilliant and so straightforward and yet like how many companies don't do yeah. that? Even it's hard for us. Like I'm not saying it's an easy thing to do, but my God, is it so valuable. Yeah, even just aligning, I think, you know, uh, challenges that I've seen in the past too is having you know even same flavors of the metrics but even slightly different definitions for what they mean which then when it comes time to quarterly reviews you're realizing oh this person said we beat it by two percent and this one said we we missed so i think metric definition alignment is actually one of the most challenging parts of this um, and actually even aligning on what is that set of metrics that you're going to to target and kind of track across the funnel so that's definitely the first exercise it's just is everybody even on the same page of what the metrics are how they're actually defined, reporting on them in the same standardized ways, and then bringing the teams together to consistently look at that. It's, yeah, I agree with you, it sounds straightforward. It's a lot of behind the scenes work for sure. Well, and it used to go back to like what I was saying earlier is like you used to have in my world of experimentation, I don't know about you guys, but you'd have web experimentation over here mm -hmm. and the, the marketers mm -hmm. would have like these KPIs and then you'd have like backend experimentation or product mm -hmm. experiments would be an entirely separate goal library, entirely different to your point, Ryan, like different segments and everything. And, you know, for everybody that's listening, that universe is gone. You don't have to be in that pain uh, anymore. Like you can have a single goal library. You can have a single library of segments. You don't need to like, to your point, Abby, like 
put yourself in a position where, you know, not only are you kind of holding your, like you're dragging this chain around with you, but you're also uh, empowering the naysayers when, you know, uh, they are looking for like, oh, well, you defined it as blue, but it's actually bluish green. And then they use that as a way to like undermine your your work. And I think that's what you're, you know, again, you don't have to live in that world anymore. And I think that's what's so exciting about being a product manager today. Yeah. And for the kind of like newbie product managers out there, what I love about product is there are so many flavors of product. And I think like today's product manager, you can spend like, you can be a PM, like data PM focus precisely on this and this definition. Like, you know, at, at bigger companies like Disney myself, like we have, we have teams focused on data governance and, and working on these best in class tools. So I think it's, really an exciting time to work work in product and work in data product as well too um switching gears uh a b testing I, a b testing is just such a, a fundamental tool defining a b tests multivariate tests to make decisions what are some best practices you all think um that product managers should have in, in using a b testing i feel like i have to take that one um <laughs> Um, but you know, first hear what Ryan and Abby said, like, it's just, it, it's just great that experimentation has reached this maturity now where it's just something that we all understand is that we have to do so that I just want to like uh, recognize that it's great to hear, uh, other awesome companies just implicitly talking about experimentation. So, you know, I think that's just pat ourselves on the back that we've reached that stage where, you know, it's just something as normal as SEO, right? That you should be thinking about experimentation. Um, you know, uh, to answer your question, uh, Nicole, I would say that you know, like the coolest thing that has happened in experimentation in the last few years is the intersection of like feature management, feature flagging, and experimentation itself. Like, again, just an awesome time to be in product. Uh, you can work more easily and effectively with engineers today than ever before to like create, you know, they'll be creating variable, they'll be controlling like how products and are released when the same time you can be creating like variations of those products more easily than ever. And you can even customize and control like who gets to see what, like Ryan makes that really good point about segmentation. And then Abby, you were talking about like, choose these goals like this is so much easier today and i just feel like if you're not already working closely with your engineers about how to build a better product then look closer at what's happening at feature experimentation because you'll just be blown away at like what's possible today versus just a few years ago so yeah i, I would say you know have a chat like first of all are you doing feature flagging and if so you're already in a great shape to like start nurturing like uh, the power of experimentation which is ultimately all about just re you know creating data that helps you feel like you know what this is right like we need to do more of this and so that's what we're in the business of is just making data back decisions and experimentation is a fantastic if not the best way of of coming to that uh, conclusion i do think it's awesome that you know, the experimentation is becoming more and more normalized and i you know Maybe five, 10 years ago, it was only Google, only Facebook, only these very large mature organizations where a very small change would have a noticeable lift uh, and impact. And now, you know, here at Sprague, every change that we run on our marketing site, our onboarding flow, everything is A-B tested and, you know, we're relatively early stage. And so it is moving earlier and earlier. You know, I do encourage to be out there regardless of company size, it's developing the habits, even if it takes, you know, a little longer than you'd like to get those results, you know, I always tell the team, it's important to run the test, even if you're super, super confident so we can measure the lift. Uh, so you at least know the positive impact. If you're hundred percent confident, let's at least just quanti quantify what that lift is. Um, and so I think it's great to see the maturity of AB testing. One actually surprising use case for us is, has been a lot of our customers are integrating Sprig into their uh, internal AB testing homegrown infrastructure or integrating into tools like Chameleon or Amplitude experimentation and looking at the behavioral data and say, hey, users are, we are driving the behavior they're looking for, but they're also able to what this, our, our in-product survey tool, able to actually measure the qualitative impact. And so, you know, if you hide the cancel button for your subscription, of course the cancellations will go down, but you're gonna have a lot of very frustrated, angry users potentially. And so we see the gold standard is having the behavioral lift 
So seeing the, the analytical impact in a positive direction, but also the qualitative impact also in a, in a positive direction. And if you can get the business metrics uh, up into the right, as well as the user sentiment up in the right, really consider that the gold standard for a successful experiment um, and feeling very confident, not only the short term, but also long term impacts on the business uh, are positive. Yeah, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Oh, sorry, Nicole. No, if, if you were, I was going to jump to the next question, Abby, but please chime in. Sure, sure. I, I was just going to say um, something you mentioned, Ryan, was also me measuring the impact. I also think that A B testing can be a good tool for disagree and commit as well when teams aren't able to make decisions or have really different ideas on what they think the right path forward is. Um, you know, we've done exercises in the past around how to rethink pricing and packaging, and there's a hundred million opinions that people have around those types of decisions. And A-B testing can help sort of give an answer to that that's a little bit less less biased than, than a debate back and forth um, between people. So that's definitely um, one thing I'd think about as well. And you know, Colin, you mentioned feature flagging and experimentation, and I think more and more PMs are leveraging experimentation and kind of taking on the mindset of the growth PM. But one thing I do see um, kind of as a pitfall or, or something that people then start to think is trying to experiment with every single change, even when perhaps there isn't the right level of data or it's not the right kind of, you know, surface area to do an experiment on. And, and then in that case, maybe feature flagging and a, a slow rollout to manage risk and mitigate risk is actually the better path to take. So I'd also just recommend thinking through when you're thinking about running an experiment, is a feature flag really what you're you're looking for and just trying to actually manage experience and risk? So whether it's trying to measure, you know, success metrics in a stat sig way versus manage risk and just sort of like have a slower rollout of something, like those are questions you would also ask yourself. So make sure you're not waiting eight weeks for statistically significant data on a change you were pretty confident in making anyways. Um, that's yeah. just one thing I tactically think about. I mean, there's a whole like practice. So like, not, I mean, there's the experimentation and then there's the art of creating the hypothesis, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, I, you know, we all have to be respectful of like the amount of hard work that goes into like coming up with a great experiment. But yeah, absolutely agree. Like it's just a form of optimization, releasing mm -hmm. a feature progressively, right? So I think, uh, yeah, that's an excellent point. One thing that caught my uh, attention this morning is so funny. I was like, okay, this is just great timing. It, um, Benjamin Franklin says, I didn't fail the test. I just found a hundred ways to do it wrong. And I'm just uh, uh, raising this point here because, you know, even the best of the best, like, you know, you hire the greatest agencies in the whole world. And guess what? They're going to have like a win rate of like, you know, maybe 80, uh, 20 percent, excuse me, 80 percent of the time they're going to get it wrong. And I just want everybody to be aware that, you know, there's this instinct to like go fast and and to follow your gut and and that isn't uh, gonna pay off ultimately you're you know you're gonna get lucky a few times um, but more often than not you're gonna get it wrong and so it's really to your point Abby like you know test where you can test and you've got a great experiment and then control release uh, mm -hmm. very very carefully because you know you don't have to live the old ways anymore. You have these tools now and you know what you can see about well, session recording, how they performed inside of that experience. Like you, you can, and I think I love this part, like you bring the CEO down and you say like, look at your customer, look at what they did here. And guess what? That'll just blow doors open uh, for you to like basically get the resources you need to go do the things you want to do. So yeah, I mean, uh, it's just an, I'm just a huge optimist. I think it's an exciting time to like be in the space. So uh, I encourage everybody to get started. Yeah. And to Ryan's point before, it's like if you can't, a wise person once said, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So like the key is having these tools in your tool belt, and then you know the world is your oyster. Um, but I do want to acknowledge, you know, data, hard quantitative data, data is really just one side of the equation of of those different tools in the tool belt qualitative uh, data and what consumers say and what they feel um, is also so key in just having a holistic product point of view. Um, I'd love to hear from folks on the panel, how do you use quantitative data in tandem with qualitative data to form a cohesive, holistic point of view about your customers? Yeah, happy to kick off here. You know, Going back to my experience at Weebly and running the A-B test, looking at the analytical data, looking at the behavioral data, the revenue data, 
the, we always looked at those data sets to start to help us understand where to dig in. And that's where the, the qualitative data fit in when we started to notice a trend that perhaps was surprising or unexpected or uh, concerning or maybe something that really warranted additional investigation. And so, you know, why I started the company uh, Sprig. And earlier this year, we launched an Amplitude integration. And so how it works is that you can connect Sprig and get your in-product survey, replay, session replay data actually right in Amplitude. And what's interesting is that you, know, you can follow that same jobs to be done that I just ran through in your Amplitude dashboard. You can see, you know, perhaps that there is a, perhaps a, an increase in signups or uh, some interesting trends in your behavioral data. And now you can have the Sprig survey data uh, that's being collected for in that exact moment, attached to that exact same event or session replay recordings and actually then answer the why. Uh, and so we've been making an incredible effort this year to integrate with other leading product insights platforms to, like I mentioned earlier in the, in the conversation, tie all the data together very easily, but also natively for product teams to be able to really kind of understand not only what the users are doing, but in the same even screen, also dig in and understand that why question. Yeah, something we've we've been talking about there is it's kind of like going from the macro to micro and, and reverse. So whether it's you know watching a, a session replay and then understanding is that representative of a larger trend and, and how significant should this be, or looking at a larger trend and trying to dig in to understand, you know, Colin, you mentioned showing the, the CEO like a recording of something that somebody is doing to actually contextualize what you're seeing. So really using both qual and quant in reverse with each other to either validate trends, explain the why, and also when you're kind of you know seeing something in the qual data, understanding if that actually is as big of an issue or if it's more of a one-off. So kind of just using them um, back and forth, going from the micro to the macro um, is something that we, we talk about internally. Yeah, and just to add on that, like uh, again, so much great research out today. So if anyone's interested, let me know. I'll share it with you. But it's just it, as much as we're excited about the, the the adoption of A/B testing, it's still hard. And if you look at the uh, programs that get it right or the companies that get it right, they do one thing: they tell stories. They don't just tell stats. And so I think that's where the qualitative data really comes in. Uh, it's so helpful. The executives they are not going to be interested in your twenty. Uh, slides about you know the wonkiness of your product and the quantitative features that are driving uh, X, Y, and Z rates. They want to hear a story, and if you and I think the qualitative data is just an excellent way to to help you, Abby, contextualize it and tell that story. So, go for stories sometimes over mm -hmm. stats. Mm -hmm. Couldn't agree more. I, I feel like empathy is such a big part of being a product owner, empathizing with our customer. And these are all tools to help us, you know, whether it's the data to get the scale, you know, the individual stories to understand at a human level how this is impacting people, it's, it's, it all comes together. Um, moving to a different agenda topic, um, the future, I, it, it is here now with AI. Um, so, so um, and I can't believe our time is coming short, but last uh, question for this panel, how is AI transforming how PMs work with data um, today and, and, and where you see it going in the future. I'll just quickly take that one. I, I just want to say, you know, anybody listening, like, you know, AI is a tool. So just be mindful of like how to use the tool. Don't think it does anything else than other than what you want it to do as a tool. So I think just taking, you know, step backwards and appreciating it for its feature, uh, for for its functionality, that is, um, is a great in, you know, perspective. Um, at Chameleon, we have our an AI, like I said earlier, which is designed to give a score to every single visitor based off their propensity to convert on a KPI you set. So if you, as a product manager, are looking to like use AI to understand, okay, what is the likelihood that this user is going to do this particular uh, um, or engage in this particular behavior, then great, our AI will basically give you that score. And then what you decide to do with that score, you know, we're a big believer in that, you know, the creativity of what you should do with the data is still best with the, the humans, but AI is great at maybe bringing to your attention some opportunities that you can use to, to exploit uh, um, 
you know, the data, the large robust sets of data. I would say at, um, at Amplitude, the way that we're thinking about it in the short term is really about how can AI accelerate time to value around product analytics? So how can we specifically help you with, you know, basically cutting out the manual task of delving through the data, pulling out what it is you should care about when you look at a chart, or even just proactively sharing with you what, what are the trends and patterns emerging in your data? You know, we already have features around root cause analysis and anomaly detection, but I think sort of the recent advancements here are just gonna be able to take that to the next level where we can really proactively share with you what it is that you should be caring about. I think another interesting application is using data to tell people what questions they should even be asking about their data and helping them sort of train themselves to be better analysts. Um, so those are a couple of the things we're exploring in the short term. Um, but I'd say in the long term, it's like every company to your point, Colin, is sitting on this behavioral data and how can we help other companies become the Netflixes of the world and use that to really optimize their product experiences, You know, whether that's onboarding or eventually even the product, the core product itself is definitely where we see things going in the long run. But I think how that interfaces with what the decisions that humans are making versus the technology is definitely uh, to be seen, but definitely the, the future we're, we're exploring and, and figuring out how we're a part of now. Yeah. The first person to join me at Sprague actually was a head of AI. So before we even hired an engineer, it was a, a very exp experienced senior uh, data scientist. And so we've been working on AI you know, since day one of the company. And it's always been core to the premise, knowing that we're gonna enable our customers to collect large volumes of data, millions of survey responses per month, actually. Uh, and the, the scale and the companies they work with, it, it quickly knew it quickly become a large data challenge to understand large volumes of data. And you know, we built all of our in-house models with open source tooling. We had human loop with uh, expert researchers reviewing all the output, tuning the models. It was very, very complex and actually uh, a large endeavor, particularly for a company, you know, of our stage. But with the advancements, you know, with OpenAI leading the way, you know, Bard is quickly um, emerging as well. There's a lot of other players now. The difficulty of implementing AI in a production-grade system, and even a system at scale, uh, has just gone from probably a 10 out of 10 difficulty to around a two out of 10 uh, difficulty. And I think the only remaining last mile is how you can actually really QA and test and ensure uh, reproducibility of the AI output. And once that's solved, I think it's gonna drop it down to a one out of 10 in terms of difficulty. And so I think every you know company and product is expected to have AI integrated at some point. I think GitHub coining it Copilot is probably the best descriptor that I can think of is that as humans, we're looking for a co-pilot mm -hmm. that gives us the control, but also augments our abilities and augments the work that we're doing to ensure that we're able to, you know, find time to value faster. And so at Sprig, we actually had to make that decision to switch over to, you know, GPT-4, and now we're rolling it out, you know, at a very large scale. And I think for anyone, you know, who is working with large data sets and understanding large uh, data sets, it, having AI integrated natively into the tool, whether it's Chameleon or Amplitude or Sprig, is going to be re really critical because you will, as a single person or even a team of people, be unable to analyze all the data that you're collecting and those patterns and anomalies. It really is a needle in a haystack. And AI can actually find that needle in that very, very large data set. Uh, and so later this month, we're making a big announcement around our vision for AI. And I do expect that, you know, any company in the product insights category, but also for all the product managers working on a product, thinking about how AI can actually fit into your own product and be a co-pilot for your end users is going to be paramount for success in the coming years. Awesome. Well, Ryan, Abby, Colin, thanks so much for being with us here. And audience, thank you for being with us here at ProductCon today. Um, hope you enjoy the rest of your conference, and we'll see you soon. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks, everyone.